Good morning. Let's get started. Um, our speaker today will be presenting on the topic of clinical documentation improvement. Tara Wilkinson is a certified clinical documentation specialist and currently serves as the Regional Medical Documentation Director for Mercy. Ms. Wilkinson received her nursing degree from Pittsburgh State University and her MBA from William Woods University. Please welcome Mrs. Wilkinson. Can you guys hear me okay? Make sure I've got the technology going correctly. Well, good morning. It's nice for you all to turn out this early to, to listen to me. <laughs> um, we will be speaking about the importance of your documentation in your medical records. Whether you're in the office, ambulatory clinics, outpatient, or inpatient. My focus is going to be mainly on inpatient, but just to let you know, the government, Medicare, and all external auditors, even your commercial insurance companies, look very closely at your documentation now. Why this is important to you is that it actually will affect your public reporting scores and quality, your quality scores. You know, did you admit a patient with a UTI that, that expired? Well, and you didn't docu document any secondary diagnoses. You know, people aren't going to choose you for their aunt or their mom or dad to go to because they're going to wonder about the care that you gave. So we're going to talk about how your documentation builds a picture for your patients and all the people that look at your charts. This slide I really like. Some of you may have seen this before, but it tells you medical documentation tells the story. Look at this first picture, poor documentation. 83-year-old male presents with the following. This is your documentation. Shortness of breath, UTI with pneumonia, low blood pressure. Shortness of breath is a symptom, low blood pressure is a symptom, UTI with pneumonia, those can be coded. You can code symptoms, you don't want to. We really need a probable diagnosis. And you can say probable or suspected in the inpatient environment just not in the outpatient or ambulatory or clinic environment. Then with improved documentation, same patient, 83-year-old male, presents the, with the following. Acute respiratory failure. Granted, they have to make sure they meet the clinical indicator criteria for that. Sepsis with septic shock and hypotension. This is a good demonstration that shows you how different clinical documentation is from the documentation that coding seeks out to code your chart. When they code your chart, that chart then is dropped and it goes out literally to all these people and they look at that. So you can see when they read your chart, they develop a mental picture of your patient because they aren't at bedside. Acute care hospital, this is us, inpatient stays, the IPPS. And what they have here is how they get up to your DRG reimbursement. DRG is a diagnosis-related group. You may know this if you do, raise your hands. This is just where they lump diagnoses that are related and tend to use the same types of resources. This is Medicare, CMS. And they go by the relative weight, which is a numerical number, one point to like five, ten point something that they assign each diagnosis. Your blended rate is a standardized dollar amount, which is assigned by Medicare, and it's determined by factors such as the CMI, case mix index, local wage index, type of facility, number of low-income patients, type of institution. All those factors go into that. And these are the building blocks of why your documentation is important. Your case mix index is the sum of relative weights, which are those diagnostic numerical assignments and the number divided by the number of cases. So your documentation divided by your volume of patients equals your CMI. CMI is very important to the hospital. Next item, there's all kinds of public and quality reporting out there. I gave you the example of the UTI a little bit earlier with the patient that expired. Your severity of illness, or your SOI, which is what I'll refer to from now on, is the extent of physiologic decompensation or organ system loss of function. 
your risk of mortality is the likelihood of that patient dying. That's why all your secondary diagnoses or your comorbid conditions along with your principal diagnosis need to reflect the actual scenario for your patient. You can see both of these, SOI and ROM, are designated into four subclasses, minor, moderate, major, extreme. If a patient expires in the hospital, they should be at a four for both of these. So this is all calculated and reflects your patient once again. And this is all publicly reported. Anybody can go online to see where they want to send their mom or dad to hospital-wise or physician-wise. You can see treatment without documentation or lack of specificity in the documentation results in a query posed to the provider. And our whole goal in improving or helping you achieve the most accurate clinical documentation is accuracy. We don't want to upcode. We do not want to exaggerate anything. We simply want to tell the real story for your patient. And historically, physicians have tended to undersell what's actually going on with their patient. And that reflects the resources we use on a patient, which is how the hospital pays their monthly bills for all those items that you ordered for that patient. You can see. This is a secondary diagnosis of diabetes, and we all know how many of our patients have that as a secondary diagnosis. Uncomplicated diabetes would be a one for severity of illness. Diabetes with any kind of renal manifestation, chronic kidney disease, a lot of them have that. That would be a two for severity of illness. You see the severity increases with the number. Diabetes with ketoacidosis would be major three. Diabetes with hyperosmolar coma would be a four extreme. Here's your risk of mortality, and that should say risk of mortality, not severity of illness there, sorry, with a secondary diagnosis of cardiac dysrhythmias, minor premature beats, moderate SA node dysfunction, major paroxysmal VTAC, four extreme, which would be your VFib. So you can see the more severe your diagnosis is, the greater your score is going to be. It's going to reflect the severity of your patient. But it has to be in a language that coding can code. That's the important thing. That's where we have the disconnect. And that's where clinical documentation typically tries to bridge that gap, so that you don't have to memorize all those things. Present on admission. This is terribly important. Um, you know, they want to know, and I'm sure you've heard of hacks or hospital-acquired conditions. If something's present on admission, make sure you document it. And I'm hoping that POA is an approved um, abbreviation for you all. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, present at the time the order for the inpatient admission occurs. And if that's unclear in the chart, if we can't determine that, we will be querying you. Coding is required to assign a PO, POA status to every diagnosis you put in the chart. And remember, you need to put all the diagnoses applicable to that patient in your chart because that's going to affect your SOI, your ROM, the CMI, all of those items. And I don't necessarily need to go through all that, but codings are required to assign a POA status. You can see there's potential pen penalties that here, if you don't have a POA, could be a hack. And those are going to be reflected in your quality scores once again. <coughs> secondary diagnoses. These are your comorbid conditions, secondary diagnoses. Those diagnoses you continue to treat but are not the reason for admission. They're not your principal diagnosis. These develop. They're either present at the time of admission, say diabetes, patient comes in with pneumonia, or they may develop um, something while they're in the hospital that's not the principal diagnosis. You can see they affect the treatment received. And to assign a secondary diagnosis, and this is CDI encoding, you don't have to worry about this part, but each diagnosis has to meet one of the following five criteria. It needs to be clinically monitored, say telemetry for a patient who has chronic AFib. You're not really doing anything different. You're maintaining their home medication, but they are on telemetry for monitoring, provides therapeutic treatment, some type of a diagnostic evaluation, increased nursing care, and an increased length of stay. If any one of those is met, that is a secondary diagnosis that we can we will code because we're utilizing resources on that. 
impact of a single word. This is a very good example. This, um, I don't mean to stand in front of you all, but um, say you've got a patient that admitted with perforated diverticulitis, you did a colon resection, and we query because there were clinical indicators supporting the diagnosis of sepsis. And it was agreed and documented by the physician. This is a real life example in one of our hospitals, which resulted in an MCT, which is a major comorbid condition. Those are what are really gonna up your SOI, your ROM, and your relative weight for your case mix index. So initially, you can see down here, There we go, there's the pointer. Initially, we had major, small, and large bowel procedure with CC. Your relative weight was 2.5609. Your reimbursement was 13,752. Your SOI was a two, and your ROM was a two, and both of those are moderate. Well, we all know that sepsis carries a lot of risks with it. You can see, answering the query for sepsis, just that one diagnosis, with the clinical indicators present, remember, your relative weight increased to 5.1. It doubled, more than doubled. Your reimbursement, 27,500. SOI, two moderate, your risk of mortality went up to a three. You can see it's kind of hard to move your SOI and your ROM. So you want to be very cognizant of the fact that if you treat or you suspect a patient has a diagnosis and you're treating for it, you've got to get that documented in the chart. And like I said, suspected or probable diagnoses are certainly allowed in the inpatient environment. As we all know, medicine is not 100%. It's not an exact science always. And sometimes you go with your gut instincts. That's why it's also called an art besides a science. You develop intuition regarding your patient. You know their history, you've read their history, you assess them, and you suspect this is going on. You need to write that in your chart. And just to let you know, this is not all about money. It's about accuracy. The money will follow. We have to pay our monthly bills so that we continue to buy IV fluids, IV pumps. But we want an accurate reflection of the patient, accurate reflection of the time that you spent with your patient, the decision making, and the complexity of the decisions that you had to make in treating that patient. Here's another example, simple pneumonia. And this one also, you can see, they came in with pneumonia unspecified. The physician just documented, the provider just documented pneumonia. The patient expired. What did I say earlier? You really want a higher SOI and an ROM to make sure that you match this, the state actually gives an expected mortality rate for your hospital every year. And you want to make sure that you reflect that if that's what's going on with your patient. You can see the first item down here shows simple pneumonia, relative weight 0.9. Geometric length of stay for that is 3.8, SOI 3, ROM 3. Patient expired. So we sent a query for sepsis and acute respiratory failure, which was unanswered by the physician. Even though clinical indicators are met, a query cannot go out unless we have clinical indicators supporting it. And that should be on your query, so you can quickly look at the clinical indicators for that patient and not have to research the entire chart so that we will have pulled that out of the record for you. So what it could have been, could have been sepsis. Relative weight would have been 1.9, went up almost one. Geometric length of stay improved from 3.8 days to 5.1. Your SOI is four, ROM is four. Well, that supports a patient that expired. So that would be appropriate. But you can see this has gotten so complicated, and I've been a nurse for almost 36 years. None of this even existed when I first became a nurse. And I've always worked in critical care, case management, or clinical documentation. So, um, you know, I just can't tell you how important your, your accurate and thorough documentation is. Coders, they are the gatekeepers for your chart as it goes out the door. They have very strict coding guidelines they have to follow uh, that are governmental, they are uh, CMS enforced. Coders can only code from physician documentation, HMP, progress notes, your off reports, your discharge summary. Coders are never allowed to assume. 
CDI can't assume either. We assume we'll be querying you. Hey, I found clinical indicators for this. Just wanted to give you the opportunity. If you think this is what you're treating, please get that documented in the chart. Coders cannot code from nursing documentation. There are two exceptions. Coders can get a BMI if, you know, someone else documented the BMI or a pressure ulcer stage. You still have to document if there's a BMI of 55 out there, doctors still have to write obesity or morbid obesity, the diagnosis that associates with that. Same with the pressure ulcer staging. You need to put in there, you know, you can get the stage from nursing documentation, but you need to actually put in there, you know, severe pressure ulcer to the bone, right heel. Probable and suspected can be used and coded. If you use a probable pneumonia, you need to make sure you get that in your discharge summary. That's a coding rule. Your probable or suspected diagnoses have to be brought to the discharge summary. There are other diagnoses we can get from your progress notes, say day two. And here is an example of excisional debridement. This changed with ICD-10, which occurred last October 1st. We're going to have many more PCS or surgical procedural changes this October 1st, coming down from Medicare. And there are five items that have to be documented if you are doing an excisional debridement. First of all, we need to know, is it an excisional debridement? Debridement we're going to have to query. We don't know, especially if it looks like it's incisional, all your documentation around that. You have to have a description of the procedure as excisional, and that term has to be documented in your chart. Description of the instrument used, you can see. Description of the tissue removed. Why did you remove it? Was it necrotic? Was it non-viable? Number four, the appearance and size of the wound, and we're talking in sonometers here. And the depth of the debridement. What did you debride down to? And these are a huge rack, which is a re recovery audit contractor. These are the people that review for Medicare fraud, your Medicare charts, your OIG, the Office of the Inspector General, and CMS. These are items that they will routinely do reviews on for every hospital that has a Medicare license. Once again, um, just to reiterate this, you can get those two items from nursing documentation, but the diagnosis associated with those has got to be documented by the provider. Queries are needed when clarification of the documentation is required to reflect more accurately the patient's clinical diagnoses, severity of illness, and risk of mortality. You know, you really want to capture what's going on with your patient. I just can't emphasize enough how this is all publicly reported. Um, you know, when you get a chance, go out there on physician compare, your health grade scores, I'm sure you've heard of that, LeapFrog, all of those utilize all this data. They collect all this data since we are all on electronic medical records now, it's accessible, and they publicly report what you do, what your day-to-day -day functions are, how your patients do and it's all available. So at some point in time, I know you're all terribly busy, but it would be interesting for you to go out and look at some of those. You can see accurate documentation of patient diagnoses and care will avoid getting a query. Although queries are educational, make sure you pay attention to those. You can really change your documentation over a period of time. I wanna ask, how many of you have ever had formal training in documentation? Do you receive that in med school? Um, can I take that as a no, since I'm not seeing a head nod one way or the other? Do you get training? Okay, th that's what I've heard. That's, it's, I can't tell you how important that is because this affects your reputation as a physician. All right, a, a query has to be non-leading. We can't say, do you think this patient has pneumonia? Well. If pneumonia is not documented in the chart, we cannot use that in the query. We have to give you some realistic answer options for the clinical indicators we have posed to you. It is a part of your legal health record. It is in the record. So if you mark unable to determine to something like us asking and giving you an example for hyponatremia, and we give you a sodium of 116, 
How does that make you look? You know. Um, best practice, you get a query answered within 48 hours. While all that information on that patient is still fresh in your mind. And I will say your discharge summary needs to be done in a timely manner also. Discharge summaries done on a patient you treated 30 days ago are not accurate. That is not a quality discharge summary while it's not fresh in your mind. Answer choices have to have an open-ended option. That's why we include other and unable to determine on your queries because we don't want to force you into a diagnosis if you feel it's something different than what is offered on the query. Any physician currently providing hands-on care to that patient can document. So if you have a consult, cardiology consult, they can answer a query also. We can pose a query to a cardiology consult. If it's a cardiology issue that we're looking at, pathology, radiology, they're not doing hands-on care. They may read the report, but they cannot be queried. There should be realistic, relevant answer choices presented. We should always have supportive clinical indicators. The words probable or suspected, I'm going to say this once again, that can be utilized, that's okay if your patient is inpatient. And mid-level providers, physician assistants, residents, nurse practitioners, they can all answer a query, they just need to be co-signed by your covering physician. Here's some common documentation issues, kind of as an example. Clinical terms, we've all seen this. Oh, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself there. There we go. We, you know, this makes perfect sense to me as a critical care nurse, left upper lobe infiltrate. Well, what does that tell Cody? Doesn't tell them if it's a pneumonia or what it may be. So you can see, coding can code these terms over on the right-hand side. Hemoglobin drop, 5.2 from 8.5. You transfuse two units of packed red blood cells. It's acute blood loss anemia if that happened, you know, within a couple of days. Maybe it's a post-op patient. We'll rehydrate patient. Okay, does that mean they have dehydration? Blood pressure, 70 over 40, undope. Okay, cardiogenic shock potentially. Bilateral breath sounds with rails. It's possible they're given them IV Lasix and Lenoxa, acute diastolic CHF. You can see this is where clinical language and coding language is somewhat different. And just want you to keep that in mind. If you can apply appropriately and accurately a diagnosis to those symptoms that you're giving, you need to do that. And you can use the terms probable and suspected. Remember, you do not have to be 100% sure. You need to continue to document all your diagnoses throughout the record. One-time documentation of something on day two you don't document that it's resolving day three or day four, it's not in your discharge summary, we have to kind of wonder, okay, well, did they rule that out? Was, were they still treating it and they just didn't get it documented? So you may receive a query on those. Um, here, you can see item three, document if a diagnosis has been ruled out. We won't know that unless you tell us that. And there are actually denials out there if a diagnosis does not appear in your discharge summary. Does it matter if you've had sepsis in every progress note every day, every consult has had it, you've had intense treatment? There are commercial insurance companies which do not have any type of regulatory entity over them that will deny if that's not in a discharge summary, even though it is blatantly evident in your chart everywhere else. So just to let you know, you know, it's a, it's a um, it's a brave new world out there for documentation. It's all kinds of regulatory issues going on, and this is not going away. It's just going to continue. And you as the provider, you guys are the solution. Um, you know, and not only do you owe for publicly reporting in your own reputation, patients can access their records, and you have a provider that you're going to refer that patient to to continue their care as an outpatient once they go home. And you need to make sure that you give a quality record to that physician to continue that care for that patient. Um, and that's another reason why your discharge summaries should be done in a timely manner. You know, frequently a patient has an appointment within a week or two weeks. Well, if you wait 30 days, that provider has already seen the patient and is thinking out there, okay, he's gonna have to go on what that, that patient's saying 
or, and what he can glean. He may have to have his nurse make several calls to try and figure out exactly what was going on in the hospital when this patient told me they were in the hospital 14 days ago. So you can see why these items are very important. Now, I'm going to go on and talk about some respiratory failure and malnutrition, which are two diagnoses that cross every specialty, oncology especially for malnutrition, surgical and or medical. Do you guys have any question about the documentation aspect so far? I just want to make sure that I want you to feel like you understand ultimately what you document is important. You don't have to know all the relative weight stuff. That, those are building blocks to, that get you to why medical documentation is so important. But, you know, a symptom will always have a low relative weight, like shortness of breath. And if that shortness of breath is accompanied by pneumonia, you need to make sure you get that pneumonia in the chart or whatever it is, acute exacerbation of COPD. And those are another couple of items that are important. We need the acuity on your diagnoses. If it's chronic COPD, you're just continuing SBN treatments on when a patient comes into the hospital for a colon resection, write that. We're giving those patients SVN treatment, so you need to make sure you remember the acuity, chronic and acute. And since last October 1st, with the implementation of ICD-10, laterality is extremely important. You need to make sure you say, you know, it's a right heel ulcer, a, a right buttocks ulcer, a left elbow ulcer. So laterality is extremely important. Malnutrition, like I said, actually, and I'm not sure what time it is. How are we doing? What time is it? Okay, great. Malnutrition crosses all specialties. Malnutrition is under-documented United States-wide. This is hard to believe, and I know it's hard to believe that sometimes we can get a terribly obese patient in and they're malnourished. Well, they're obese because they're eating, say, fast foods every day, no veggies, they have no exercise, and they're malnourished even though they're overweight. You all utilize something called the Aspen criteria, which is what Mercy utilizes system-wide. It's very specific. Your dietitians do a very specific physical assessment to figure out if a patient is malnourished. You guys, any of you guys look at your dietitian notes in your records? <coughs> Okay. It's important because the United States has gotten to the point where we have more malnutrition than some of the what we call third world countries out there. Um, you can see increased morbidity if they're malnourished, decreased wound healing, increased risk for infection, increased complications, and decreased convalescence. Malnutrition also increases your mortality. So, you know, once again, we go back to our risk of mortality. Increases treatment, resources used to care for that patient, and an increased length of stay when they're in the hospital. So, overall, it increases cost and decreases quality of life. You can see this is getting a little old now, but we're at 2016. 2010 healthcare costs and utilization projects included over 1,000 hospitals. 1.2 million discharges in 2010 with a malnutrition diagnosis. That just seems just unbelievable to me in the United States. Longer length of stay, 12.6 versus 4.4 days. And that's for people without malnutrition is the 4.4 days, with malnutrition, 12.6 days. Higher costs, 27,000 versus 9,400 per hospital stay. Two times as many discharges to home care they need subsequent care that they cannot give themselves when you discharge them to home. Death, five times more common. Oncology patients. Almost every oncology patient will have some form of malnutrition, whether it's the fact that they have a reduced appetite, their care oftentimes makes it to where they either throw up what they've eaten, they're nauseated constantly, they don't feel like eating. And the disease process itself. Um, you can see incidence of malnutrition in an oncology patient is 25 to 66%. So we're talking, you know, really pay attention to that 
And, you know, if nursing has not asked for a dietary consult, make sure you do. Just write that order, dietary consult. That's all it takes. Benefits of nutrition intervention. Well, these are fairly obvious, obviously. Leads to significant improvements in patient outcomes. 25% reduction in pressure ulcer incidence. And we all know you have to document those five items for pressure ulcers. 28% decrease in avoidable readmissions. And CMS looks at your readmissions. Like for your CHF patients, they look at that. They look to see if that patient is admitted within 30 days of discharge from the last inpatient admission, and you're penalized for that. However, they give you grace days if they also have malnutrition. They know that patient is sicker than a patient with CHF without malnutrition. So there are benefits, and the government recognizes that malnutrition affects every other disease process going on with that patient. 14% fewer overall complications. Average length of stay is reduced by approximately two days. You guys know this. Nutrition risk identified, inflammation present, yes. Goes on down, no. Starvation related to malnutrition. Okay, acute respiratory failure also crosses every diagnosis that you all have or could have, from surgical patients to oncology patients to every other type of medical patient out there. Um, ICD-10 asked us to be more specific with our respiratory failure as of last October 1st. You can see now they want to know, is it acute hypoxic respiratory failure or is it acute hypercapnic respiratory failure? You all have the handouts. Make sure you pick up a handout if you want one. This entire PowerPoint is in your handout, so you have this to refer to if you need to or take an extra one to pass on to a peer if they were unable to make it. And you know what? You do not have to have AVGs or you do not have to be on a vent to, for a patient to have a diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. So you want to make sure you know that. Now, if you don't have an ABG, you can go by your SBO, SPO2, and that should be adjusted for your pH, your temp, and your PCO2. Physical manifestations to support acute respiratory failure diagnoses. These are obvious, but you know, we don't always document these. They're not always in our record to support the diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. Use of accessory muscles, tachypnea, greater than 30, cyanosis, unable to speak in full sentences, blue lips, pursed lips, blue nail bed, clubbing, tripod position, agonal respirations. You guys know all this stuff. Um, we just need to make sure we get it in the chart. In your physical assessment, make sure you document that. Treatment to support <coughs> respiratory failure diagnoses. These are some of the items you're going to see in your clinical indicators if we send you a query for acute respiratory failure. You're going to see that symptomology that we just told you about. You're also going to see these treatment items. They're on the vent. Are they intubated? What kind of oxygen therapy are they getting? Do they have respiratory stimulants on CPAP, BiPAP, aerolyzed bronchodilators, IV or inhaled steroids, treatment of the underlying condition that could be causing the acute respiratory failure. Post-procedure and trauma respiratory failure. You need to accurately document what you suspect the underlying cause of the respiratory failure day two after a surgery is. Post-op respiratory failure describes a time period, not the cause. If you think it is due to anesthesia or perhaps pain medications, you need to document that. will give us a different code that we need to assign. CDC follows all this stuff. Following situations of respiratory failure should be specified and do not result in coding of a complication. Make sure that's clear. These do not result in coding of a complication. If it's secondary to a pre-existing condition, say you've got a patient that came in with chronic COPD and they had a colon resection and they're struggling after the procedure, postoperatively, the time period. Well, you can say, you know, it's due to an exacerbation of the COPD. Progression of preoperative disease process. Perhaps they are recovering from a pneumonia they had two weeks ago. Effective anesthesia due to adverse effects of narcotics or other meds. 
That kind of specificity is what they're wanting to follow. This type of specificity, you know, the, the UK, Europe, they've all had ICD-10 for many more years than we have. And you would be surprised at how they assess their population needs due to the information they get from their ICD-10 coding. So this is where we're a little late in getting on the bus, but we are finally there. Here we go. Do not document post-operative respiratory failure or respiratory failure following surgery unless the surgery was the cause of the failure. And I would suggest to you to just say, I suspect the surgery caused or the procedure caused the respiratory failure. That's clear. That's cut and dried. Now we know. It's not due to anything else. You can see you need acuity for your respiratory failure. It can either be acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. You need the specificity with hypoxia, hypercapnia. If you don't know, unspecified. Tobacco use. This is a new item from ICD-10 also. You need to talk about whether your patient is a tobacco user. How many pack your smoker? Do they utilize chewing tobacco, perhaps? It's a big deal from where I'm from. Um, Occupational exposure to, to tobacco smoke, whether they work in an environment where a lot of people smoke, do, do you live in a home where the other person smokes a lot and you're exposed to that, they don't go outside to smoke. And you can see mild, moderate, or severe respiratory distress and respiratory insufficiency do not equal respiratory failure. Insufficiency is kind of a vague, nebulous word that doesn't really give the specificity that, that we need to reflect your patient. Clarify the need for continuous home oxygen, dependence on home O2. We need, if a patient comes in and we continue O2 because they're on home O2, home O2 at home, we need to know what's that diagnosis. We are continuing to treat them and that's a resource that we're utilizing on that patient. Blood gases and mechanical vent are not required for the diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. Just please remember that. Respiratory failure may be documented as a principal diagnosis except in cases where these are present on admission. It's called SOAP. It's like the old charting SOAP, but it's not that. Sepsis, if sepsis is present on admission, it would have to be your principal diagnosis. Any obstetrical diagnosis any AIDS or HIV diagnosis, or any poisoning diagnosis. Other than those four groups, your respiratory failure can be the, your principal diagnosis. And you don't necessarily have to worry about this. Coding will determine that. But we need to make sure you document these items so that we know what coding rule or guideline we need to follow on that. Documented words for coding. And you can see how it affects your SOI and your ROM. Respiratory insufficiency, respiratory distress, one and one. Dyspnea, that's a symptom, that's not a diagnosis. Acute respiratory insufficiency, acute respiratory distress. We would prefer you use the term acute respiratory distress syndrome, syndrome which actually has an ICD-10 code. You can see how it progresses. Acute respiratory failure, if it's unspecified, with hypoxia, with hypercapnia, it's a four for both SOI and RON. But if you don't write the acute, if you just say respiratory failure, we will need to query you for that acuity. So just remember, once again, acuity is vital and the specificity. What, what we, I tend to tell my physicians, if you're thinking it, document it. You can be brief. You don't have to give me a full sentence. But if you think it and you suspect it, document it. That's, that's going to be definitely in your and the patient's favor. You can see acute respiratory failure following surgery, which tells us the surgery caused it. That's a four. Post-op respiratory failure, that doesn't give us an acuity. It doesn't tell us, is it due to the surgery for sure? We don't know. Is that, are you thinking a time period? Acute post-procedural respiratory failure. There you go. 